TitleCapture.com launched back in 2013. They finished 2021 with $280,000 a month in revenue. And they've grown nicely, 5 to 10% year over year. The, the, the definition of a healthy bootstrapped company, they profit 30% every month. So on $333,000 a month in top line revenue today, call it $90,000 worth of profits, which they keep 50% of that in the bank to grow their cash balance, now over $600,000. He likes to see three to five months of uh, expenses in the bank to stay safe. Now thinking about capital allocation, what can he buy? Can he buy distressed asset to keep growing the company? He's got the team to do it. 35 folks, 10 engineers as they look to continue to scale in a bootstrapped way. Hey folks, my guest today is Alex Simon. He's the co-founder of TitleCapture.com, where they help U.S. title agents, real estate agents, and loan officers provide hyper-accurate cost estimates to home buyers and sellers. The company was founded in 2013, 100% bootstrapped, and now doing almost $4 million in ARR. He's got personal skills and background, including product to design and marketing. Alex, you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, um, really uh, thankful for being uh, on your podcast, Nathan. You bet. Um, now, did you start off sort of as a broker and said, you know what, I don't like this whole commission structure. Let me go build a SaaS company instead. No, no, no. It, it's the, the story is actually uh, a lot simpler and not that glitzy. And you know, we, me and my co-founder, were developing you know software, basically outsourced, getting projects and whatnot. And at some point. In 2013, we kind of got fed up of uh, that business model. And then we decided, hey, let's build something that we own and we sell a subscription instead of just constantly going back to step one with every new client. And so what happened was that um, we, had a, the, we had a company who wanted uh, us to build a rate calculator app for them. Right. And that's when we decided, well, hold on, instead of actually selling it to them, let's find out more about this need and let's do some research because they're pretty big. And if they need it, chances are that the whole market might need something like this. And we do the homework and we propose to them, hey, you don't have to pay us hundreds of thousands of dollars, just pay us a thousand dollars a month, you know, going forward and we'll cap it lifetime deal and we'll build it. But Oh, it's good. We're going to own it, and they said yes, and that was the start of what title capture. Are they still uh, paying one k per month today? Yeah, but they were acquired by one of the biggest uh, title insurance companies in the country, First American. Did they cancel they title capture after they were acquired, on. or they're still they're still paying and using? No, it? no. The funny story is the um, the acquiring company already had a solution, but the people that were using us they sort of were activists and they didn't want to let go of it. And so they kind of opposed uh, canceling and we're still with them. Sounds like you need to write a book, The Activist Customer. <laughs> yeah, that's that awesome. That would be a good customer success book. <laughs> that would. So, so how did you structure this in the early days? Because I have a lot of founders listening that are launching their first product. Someone has told them, yes, we're willing to pay. But making the leap from someone verbally saying yes to actually signing a DocuSign and maybe actually wiring via Stripe the first you know, down payment is a whole other issue. So how did that work for you? Well, I mean, we were pretty fortunate. Um, what what happened in the or, well here's another funny story we were supposed to be three partners right um i was kind of on the design side and we had a programmer and then my co-founder who was doing sales and business development right and when we decided that we were going to build this thing we also in parallel booked a booth at the annual convention in west palm beach called alta one like alta being the american land title association the problem was that three weeks or four weeks before the trade show, our programmer kind of went missing in action. Like, forget about it. We didn't have any code. We didn't have anything. So I had some background in computer science and I did figure it out on my own. So obviously our V1.0, I don't think it was very functional. It looked great. It was something to show people at the trade show. Um, obviously we pivoted and we made it work, you know, the coming weeks, but we went at the trade show and our go-to-market strategy was practically non-existent. We got lucky because one person at the trade show who was a, the national sales rep for a large title insurance company uh, loved it, right? And our customers are the title agencies, right? They're the resellers for title insurance policies. The title insurance company is, they're like the brokers, the middleman, right? And so every title insurance company has tens and hundreds and thousands of title agencies that they do business with. 
So this guy saw our product. He was like, dude, I would love to put it in front of all my title agencies because I'd love Why, to Why though? I mean, I don't want to them. disrespect you, but you weren't our developer. How are you able to build something that this guy's never seen before and you're not even a developer? I mean, what, why, why hadn't someone else done this thing yet? It's a slow, non-tech savvy industry. You know, and back in 2013, um, there weren't many solutions. Uh, and the ones that existed looked like they're from the 90s. I see. So when we came in with a responsive, modern looking thing that was easy to use, and, you know, I mean, we had background in creating product. So it was obviously superior. And what we added as a nice touch was that we branded it. Uh, we basically made it a, a white labeled web app for each and every single customer I so see. that when they put out this rate calculator, it was representing them and it was nicely branded and all that. So, so it won with ease of use and aesthetics. Oh, what's going on there, YouTube? Good to see you guys. Now imagine this. You love watching these interviews with SaaS founders, but imagine if we took all of the valuation data out from over 2,807 interviews I've done manually. Saves you a lot of time. Well, we've done this. We've built it into the beautiful interface inside of FounderPath. Check this out. I'll show you how you can access this in a second, but you log in, you connect your Stripe account, you see your valuation real time, you can see what it changed over the past 88 days, and even set goals for valuation this year. Now, the secret valuation is there's many different ways to value a SaaS business. So the reason you're going to see three or four different valuations inside of your FounderPath dashboard, this is all free, by the way, is because depending on who's doing the buying of your SaaS company, you're going to get a different valuation. A VC is going to pay a different valuation. Private equity firm is different. If you're going to do a minority sale, that's different. And if you sell the whole business, that's a different valuation. You can see all those when I hover over here. Right, so the teal is what a VC would pay, yellow is what private equity, and red is if you sold the whole thing outright. Now what's cool about this is this is not built off random data. Again, you guys hear these interviews on YouTube, all these data are built from real-time valuation data points founders share with us on the show. So traction, 1.2 million, seed round, 3.7 raise, they sold 22% of their business. Go in here and filter by the event. Maybe you only wanna see companies that have sold the whole business. Well, here are a bunch that have been acquired, the valuation and the multiple. Maybe you're going out right now and you're raising your seed round. Well, go in here and look at all this recent seed deals that went down, what they raised, what valuation they raised at, and what percent that they sold. There's never been a larger data set of SaaS valuations than what you can get now inside of FounderPath, and we're thrilled to bring it to you. All right, we're going to go back to the YouTube video here in a second, but if you want to check this tool out, if you want to jump in and sign up, you can check it out for free to get your valuation at this link, this link, founderpath.com forward slash products forward slash valuations. Or if you go to founderpath.com and hover over products, click on get your valuation here, and go ahead and sign up to give it a whirl. Again, all that valuation data live right inside the platform. I hope to see you there. All right, let's jump back into the interview. So fast forward to today, how many customers are you working with? We have signed up of 1,500 title agencies thus far. The market in total is 13,000. Um, you know, so it's... With competitors and everything, we're pretty, um, you know, satisfied with how how far we've come. In and a very what is what do each of those fifteen hundred pay per month on average? The the ACV is about four grand. So that's annual per, value per right? year, right? So it's a, a slightly above three hundred a month uh, mm -hmm. average. But we have it's customers in the thousands a month. So can we take the 1500 customers times four grand ACV? That would put you at like a 6 million run rate today. But you said in the bio, you're more at 4 million. So no, it's there's, not yeah, we've signed up. We've signed up 1500. And when you take out the churn companies, um, I don't know, we're about around the thousand active. Okay, so thousand active at four grand a year puts you at a 4 million run right. rate today or about 330,000 yeah, yeah. a month in revenue. Yeah. And yeah. where were you exactly one year ago? One year ago, we were um, six percent less because I remember the growth in twenty twenty two was six percent. Um, the real estate market definitely took a bit of a hit towards the end of of the year last year. Mm -hmm. We have seen a bit more churn than usual. 
our churn is normally at about 0.6, 0.7% month over month. Mm -hmm. um, but in the sort of last couple of months of 2022, we did see it up to 1.7, 1.8. Um, people got scared. A lot of title agencies decided to kind of cut costs across the board because they did, didn't know what was coming, you know, so they take, took all this sort of preemptive action. Um, but it has come back down since then. So people are starting to get a little more confident about where the market's going. But it's been kind of three, four months rough where our net new MRR was negative. Okay, so 313, 313,000 a month a year ago would be 6% growth yeah. up to 333 today. Take us back one more yeah. year. What'd you finish 2021 with MRR wise? Do you remember? 280, something like 280. that. 280. Okay. So, I mean, this is the definition of like, you know, people say overnight success, but no, you're just plugging away five to 15% yeah. year over year growth for the past seven, eight, nine, 10 years, yeah. right? And, yeah. And fully well, bootstrapped. It's actually. Totally bootstrapped. And, and what's actually uh, now becoming very evident is that growth is tapering because of the fact that we're going higher into the sort of market share um, quota. And because you have other competitors, because whatever, you've already signed up the people who are tech savvy and, you know, they want to use technology. It's getting increasingly difficult to grow or to maintain stable growth by sheer new customers. So now what really becomes uh, a necessity for us strategically is to start looking at building more product to increase that ACV. So for example, um, you know, our uh, product is, is a rate calculator, but the next uh, step of the process is a full on settlement software, which helps the title agency manage the whole transaction. You own that product. That you upsell that is, product. We don't have that product yet. There's another competing company that came along in 2016 that that disrupted that market well, why don't you buy them why, why didn't you build for it improvement um what do you mean well why didn't you go buy it? if you know that's the next upsell why, why haven't you guys built that internally to start upselling yourself or or why have you not gotten bond that bought in that competitor we just didn't get around to making that definite decision, right? So it's 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 because of internal decision making um, that's slightly slower, and um, but we definitely have to start moving either buy or build whatever because that's a forty thousand ACV product. It's a ten times. So if you want to grow from this point on, you have to really start going out there and building more value. Alex, it's what's the team size today? How many folks? Thirty-five to forty people. Oh, wow. Okay. How many engineers? Um, up to 10, not more than 10. Are they all full-time or do you use sort of outsource uh, development shops? They're full-time. I think our DevOps engineers are outsourced. You're what? Okay. So what, like five, 10 of those or no? No, it's about two people. Two or three. Okay. Interesting. Um, very cool. And then I guess, talk to me. I mean, this is a great bootstrap story. It's not every day you hear a bootstrapper going up to 4 million bucks in ARR. So I want to focus a little bit on that. Um, are you running it sort of right at break even, or do you guys have profits every month? Oh, no. The company's highly profitable. It's 33% profit market. Okay. So you guys will so, do then about $90,000 a month in profit on your 330000 yeah. up top line. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? So We've what do you do with that as a capital allocator? As a capital allocator, what do you do with that 90 grand each month in profits? Do you pay it out as dividends? Do you reinvest it? What do you do? We pay it out right now. But again, we're also um, making sure the, the cash is there to kind of sustain whatever might happen, right? So we're taking all kinds of, uh, you know, good financial, you know, safety measures. Well, so what, uh, what makes you feel safe? gets distributed. How, how much cash in the bank makes you feel safe? Three months worth of expenses. You know, which is how much for you? Cash. Well, it should be about uh, half a million, five hundred, six hundred thousand. Okay, interesting. That's and a good target to get to. Yeah, as a as a cushion, just to make you feel safe. That makes sense. Now, yeah. how do you structure the ninety thousand dollars in payouts each month? We had Bridget on with you can book me. Who had a whole profit sharing plan she does each month. How do you guys think about distributing? We just um, make it half half because we're two partners, fifty percent each. And, uh, well, we don't take it all, right? We kind of limit it um, to the point where half stays in cash. Um, you know, it just adds to the cash every single month. 
So 45 K of the 90 K would stay in the business. So your cash balance yeah. is now 650,000 yeah. and you guys each take whatever, 20, 30,000 a month. You split the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. And that's your salary that or is that on top of your salary? Yeah. No, that's, that's basically what we pay ourselves. Um, I see. You know, I see. No, that's great. I mean, I love, I love this model. Now, if we look at like personally, what you, what maybe you would make on the company over time, like right, 25 grand a month from the dividends times 12 months, I think is like $300,000 per year. And the reason I set that context is if someone came to you and offered you and your partner to buy the whole company for, you know, say uh, 10 million all cash upfront today, right. Do you sell? Uh, it's a tough, that's a tough question to answer. Um, we're definitely open to an exit opportunity, but at the same time, we know that there's room because of my conversations with all the, our customers, there's a lot of opportunity. And on one hand, there's more we can build and grow the company. Um, on the other hand, um, when comparing a financial buyer's offer with the existing bigger sort of settlement software or insurance company, the value of our customers that we have today to them is a lot higher than what a financial buyer would offer, right? We were actually doing the math. I'm not going to name any names, but we realized that for one of our partners, a buyout would be in the range of 60 to 80 million. You know, that would be fair value to them. Actually, that would be a discount, you know, so that, that would be really, I mean, look, I see a lot of deals in today's market. That would be a premium exit valuation. So why are you yeah. not signing and taking that immediately? Because we didn't get the offer yet. We don't have any offers because we haven't been as proactive as we should have in, in networking and just being in front of all the potential um, strategic acquirers, right? So we have to do a lot more of that. You know, that's my take on it. Well, so what are, so Just what, focus how too are much on the work, you know? On, yeah. I mean, so how are you thinking about the business, I guess, moving forward? You know, um, it sounds like you're very comfortable and this is not a bad thing, by the way. I'm not, this is not a discount being comfortable. This is a, it's a compliment. You're in a very comfortable spot. So you can keep doing status quo, no problem. I don't know if you're competitive, yeah. you play varsity sports back in the day, maybe you want to go build a billion dollar company. That would be a different model. Or maybe say, you know what, I want to go build a family and get out of operating and free up my time and sell the whole thing. Wh which of the buckets do you fit in or a different bucket? Um, I would, I would be in the second because I always want to challenge myself and build a bigger thing mm -hmm. and more. So the way I see it, it's, it, you know, this is an asset. So I need to grow its value or build more assets. If I can't do this, it's, it doesn't matter, right? We've, the sky's the limit. And no matter how small the niche is, if you dive deep in it, you'll find opportunity everywhere. We've actually discussed finding a distressed insurance underwriter that we could buy, you know, that we, we would need an investor, obviously. We would need, you could take outside money buy that dis distressed underwriter and use our technology right to position it to create an angle and start competing with the bigger underwriters and and that's a different market altogether because we're talking about hundreds of millions in revenue every year it's insurance right yeah. so there's there's all sorts of things we i th i feel like the best um the, and the most important thing is is for the owners and the founders to get on the same page and and make these calls you know because you don't always have the same values you don't always have the same uh you know wants right and so i think moving forward is usually slower very when, good when there's a pie in the beginning there's no pie you, you move at the speed of light but then like, ah, you know yep Alex, we're out of time. So let's wrap up here quickly with a famous five. Number one, favorite book. Favorite book. I'm going to plug in my, you know, Dan Martell's Buy Back Your Time. Let's Number, go. That's a good one. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, many of them. But if I had to choose one, why is this so difficult, man? Um 
I don't know. I have no we'll idea. Uh, let's say Elon Musk, because he's on Twitter a lot and it's funny. Number three, how, what online tool do you use uh, or is your favorite online tool for building title capture? Uh, HubSpot. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Wow, that's about six. Okay, that's good. Um, and what's your situation? Married, single kids? Married, two kids. That's two awesome. Two daughters. How old are you, Alex? I'm 39, going over 40. That's awesome. Congrats. Uh, <laughs> happy early birthday. Thanks. Last question. Something you wish you knew when you were 20. Something I wish when I was 20. You uh, knew, um, yeah. I wish I knew that, oh man, you're asking tough questions, man. Um, damn. That building a business, um, that actually, um, how should I put this? No, I'm having a hard time putting it because it's very complex. Um, we can skip it. It's no problem. Yeah, we can skip it. It's, there's All a right. lot of ideas. Like I'm having a hard time. <laughs> Guys, there you have it. Titlecapture.com launched back in 2013. They finished 2021 with $280,000 a month in revenue. And they've grown nicely, 5 to 10% year over year. The, the, the definition of a healthy bootstrapped company, they profit 30% every month. So on 333,000 bucks a month in top line revenue today, call it 90,000 bucks worth of profits, which they keep 50% of that in the bank to grow their cash balance. Now over 600,000 bucks. He likes to see three to five months of uh, expenses in the bank to stay safe. Now thinking about capital allocation, what can he buy? Can he buy a distressed asset to keep growing the company? He's got the team to do it. 35 folks, 10 engineers as they look to continue to scale in a bootstrapped way. Alex, thanks for taking us to the top. Thanks, Nathan. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com forward slash Slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right. I'll be in the comments. See ya.